So thanks for having me on the Oracle Groundbreaker Asia Pacific virtual tour. My name is Maarten Mulders. I work as a consultant for info support, a company in the Netherlands, and we typically uh, prefer to work with technology that we consider awesome sauce, technology that we love, that we are enthusiastic about. And today I want to share with you a story about uh, GraalVM. My first introduction to GraalVM was uh, quite a few years already at Java Zone, where I attended a talk, and I learned that GraalVM lets you run basically any language you wish for. And I was wondering, any language? Is that really true? Can I run any language on the Java virtual machine using GraalVM? That sounds very interesting. So I decided that the only way to find out if that's really true is to start building my own language, my own yeah, implementation of a computer language on GraalVM. And today I want to share with you the story of how that went and what I learned from it. So that's why I called my presentation Building a DSL with GraalVM. And before we get started, we need to dive in a little bit, because what actually is a DSL? A DSL or domain-specific language is a language for, meant for computers to execute, but targeted at a very specific domain. And that's why it is considered to be domain-specific. We already know quite a few domain-specific languages. For instance, this is a domain-specific language. It can be executed by a computer. That means it can be executed by a relational database that runs on a computer. And it is targeted at a specific domain of querying data that is inside a database table. And you are probably familiar with it. It's not a very hard language to learn, but it's not useful to do just anything. It's very useful for working with databases, but it's not at all useful for other purposes. Or what about this language? This language is not about banking. It's about specif specifying the behavior of a computer program in a, in a standardized form. All these executable tests or specification by example. And the example happens to be, in this case, about a system that allows you to transfer money. But the language is more generic than that, and it's targeted at specifying system behavior. This one I came across on another conference, which is a, a made up uh, domain specific language. It was targeted for a specific uh, transportation company, Wolf, Sheep, Cabbage and Co. Transportation Limited, um, which basically uh, tries to transport cabbages across a river. But, well, this is a problem you may be familiar with. How do we actually transport the cabbage without the wolf eating sheep or the sheep eating the cabbage? And they uh, asked the authors of that talk to, um, to come up with a computer language so they could run simulations before trying it in real life, risking to lose either the wolf, uh, risking to lose either the sheep or the cabbage which would be quite unfortunate, of course. And as you can see in this example, a domain-specific language does not always have to be very complex. It, uh, a very uh, natural language it is actually pretty much like uh, the implementation language, which happens to be Scala, uh, but it is readable enough for a domain expert to be able to reason about the program and to make changes to it. And my final example of a domain-specific language for today is this one. This language is called BrainFuck, and technically it is not a domain, unless you would consider impressing your friends or making your head explode a real-life domain. The language is considered to be an esoteric language, although we have to admit that taste is not to be discussed, because not everyone really finds this beautiful. BrainFuck as you just saw it, is uh, typically written without white space, without com commands, um, without spaces even, 
uh, just as you saw it, but in a more condensed form, everything that is not recognized in the language as an instruction is considered a command, uh, which is interesting because it means that if you have real commands, you cannot end them with a dot because the dot is a recognized command in the language. So this uh, program, I've reformatted here and I've added a lot of comments, uh, runs the very simple task of adding the numbers two and five together and printing out the output. It does so by allocating the number two in a slot, moving to the next slot, uh, allocating the number five, then um, moving back and forth between the first slot to move bits from the one slot to the other, and then finally increasing the outcome with the value of 48 to find the corresponding ASCII value for that. Well, you may imagine from this little example already that it's a language that is very hard to uh, write a program in. It's also rather hard to read programs in this language for a human, uh, but actually the execution for a computer program is pretty simple because it will usually uh, be able to convert any program from Rainfuck into standard C using find and replace operations. But that's not the goal of today's talk. The goal of today's talk, of course, is that we want to be able to run programs with it. And I have created for you a, a Java web application, standard Spring Boot stuff, but this time it runs on OpenJDK with GraalVM enabled. This is the same program as I just showed you on the slides, but this time it is uh, running, it is entered in the web application. And when I run the program, it will tell me the outcome that we expected already, which is seven. And it also tells me it ran in 14 milliseconds. Now, if you see this, you may be curious how that works. Is this all written in Java? Yes, it is. And to be even more precise, it's not written as um, uh, Java code that executes BrainFuck statements, but it is a language that runs on the Java virtual machine and also leverages constructions from the Java virtual machine. And we will discover how that works. So a little bit more about BrainFuck, which can be useful to understand what we're talking about. The BrainFuck memory model, for instance, is very simple. It consists of 30,000 slots or variables, if you wish, uh, typically indexed uh, with a zero starting index, and each can hold a value that is exactly one byte big. The program has one pointer, which, uh, uh, which you can use to, uh, to look at a specific slot in the memory, uh, and you can move the pointer back and forth using the some of the commands that are available to you in the language. Now there are in total eight commands, plus means to increase the value in the current slot, while minus means to decrease it. The dot means to print a value to standard out, while the comma means to read one byte from standard in. To op opening a square bracket means that if the value in the current slot equals zero, the program must jump until after the matching closing bracket. Correspondingly, a closing square bracket means if the value in the current slot is not equal to zero, uh, the program should jump to after the matching opening bracket. And finally, we can move the pointer left and right, just one by one. So just move it one slot to the right, one slot to the left. Those eight commands are the whole language. And you may think, well, this is a rather limited language. Well, the funny thing is this language is in fact Turing complete which means to say that you can write any algorithm in it. Now, saying that a, pro a programming language is Turing complete is maybe a bit of an un uh, useless statement. You could say if a car is, is not able to drive, why would it be a car? Is it actually a car if it cannot drive? And you may be right if you say that. But BrainFuck is also considered to be a Turing tar pit which is a subcategory of Turing complete languages. And it says, well, you can write any algorithm in this programming language, but it may not necessarily be a good idea or even worse, it may be a very bad idea to do so. You may easily end up blowing your head, for instance. Well, enough about BrainFuck for now. 
let's move to GraalVM. GraalVM started out as a research project by Oracle Labs and the University of Linz in Austria. And can be considered a research project to come to one virtual machine to rule them all. Well, that sounds like an ambitious thing, right? What they mean with that is, well, there's a lot of research in programming languages, but they kind of suffer from this syndrome where not having a suitable performance runtime, which is also easy to debug and to instrument, uh, where there's not enough tooling available, it typically leads to programming languages that are, well, not that widely used, even though they may have interesting uh, capabilities. Now, GraalVM strives to build a platform, a virtual machine, where you can run a programming language without having to worry about all these other things, like, for instance, uh, can I debug my program? Will it perform? Uh, uh, will it be fast enough? Uh, will I be able to add additional tooling to it? Additionally, uh, a syndrome that many interpreted languages suffer from is the fact that, well, in an interpreted mode, you need to write to have an interpreter for the programming language, and that needs to be built by the language designers or language implementers. But if you want to have a really run, fast running program, interpreted mode is typically not going to work, and you need some kind of a compiler that compiles it into native code. And there you will duplicate a lot of the knowledge that you already had in the interpreter. There again, GraalVM claims to be of help by have, uh, letting you implement that knowledge just one time, where GraalVM will be able to assist you in running both interpreted or compiled mode. In fact, GraalVM is a very large project which consists of many components, and the components that we will be using or looking at today are the GraalVM compiler just a little bit, uh, and mainly Truffle. There's also, for instance, the Substrate Virtual Machine, which you may know if you have been using um, uh, native executables, for instance, then you will be touching the Substrate VM. Or if you are, are targeting to run C or C++ programs on top of the Java Virtual Machine, you will need Sulong and LLVM. But today we're not doing that. Today we're looking at interpreted languages, and that's where Truffle comes in. There are already implementations available, for instance, for Ruby and JavaScript, and their performance is rather impressive. I'm not going to dive into that today, but uh, there are plenty of talk around that show you performance graphs of native Ruby versus JRuby versus uh, Ruby on top of GraalVM, for instance. And the same is for JavaScript. We're uh, just slightly touching the GraalVM compiler, as I said, because there's an interesting thing. You can run any Truffle language on any Java virtual machine, but you can also run them on uh, a GraalVM-enabled Java virtual machine. You don't need to, but you can. And if you, uh, when, when I asked someone uh, inside Oracle, why would I do that? They said, well, it will most likely perform better. Hey, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? It will most likely perform better. So I decided to do some benchmarks. Benchmarks, of course, are very dangerous, but nevertheless, let's try. So I have a program which is called jappy.bf. There's, by the way, a large collection of uh, BrainFuck programs available on the internet. And Yapi is yet another pi calculator. It calculates 15 digits of pi and prints out the result. If you run it on a standard Java hotspot 64-bit uh, uh, virtual machine, the average time in milliseconds per operation will be around 53 with a mean error of one millisecond per operation per invocation. Well, that's pretty impressive. Running that, however, on a GraalVM enabled virtual machine brings that number down to 45 milliseconds per operation. And then again, uh, a mean error of just one. Now, 15 digits of pi is not the most complex task to perform, even if you <laughs> implement it in BrainFuck. So I changed the program a little bit to calculate 45 numbers. 45 digits of pi. And then, of course, the, the time that each invocation takes goes up. It goes up to 207 milliseconds per invocation with a mean error of two. And then again, GraalVM takes only 185 milliseconds per operation with a mean square of mean error of three. 
again around 10 percent lower and that's an interesting thing isn't it and we'll see shortly how that comes but first let's dive into truffle truffle as i said is the the part that allows us to run interpreted languages uh, on top of the java virtual machine if you look at the documentation truffle is described as, an, as a library for building programming language implementations right so far so good as interpreters for self-modifying abstract syntax trees and that latter part that's very interesting so there's so they speak about self-modifying abstract syntax trees well what is an abstract syntax tree here's a little part of the abstract syntax tree for my program that adds the numbers five and two an abstract syntax tree always has one root node this is where the program execution start and then there's uh, nodes for each step that the program needs to execute incremental value incremental value uh, jump to another location incremental value and nodes can also have child nodes so the jump can determine whether or not to dive into the, that subtree now the self-modifying part here is that a program typically enters execution using the interpreter which is good and there's a lot of nodes here that that invoke each other and, and, and program execution goes on and on and on which is all fine and good and at a certain point in time they may delegate some logic to the runtime which for simplicity reasons is just a java virtual machine code that is already available to you through standard java apis another thing that may happen is that that interpreted code is de determined so important that uh, GraphVM decides to uh, to compile it to native code. For instance, the functions X and Y in this case both are compiled to native machine code. We can't exactly determine the nodes, but we can see that they interact with runtime code or interpreted code. And this transfer from going to interpreted code to compiled code to runtime code back and forth back and forth all directions that's what the, that's the self-modifying part that we saw the trick here is that they use a technique which is called partial evaluation and that may sound very complex but if you are a little bit familiar with mathematics it's not that hard to follow let's take a simple mathematical function which calculates the number x to the power of n only for positive integers well, x to the power of n is exactly 1 if n equals 0. So x, uh, x to the power of 0 is always 1. Now, if n is odd, we can say that f, uh, that this function equals um, the same function with x untouched and n minus one and that multiplied with x and if n is even then we can say well f is equal to f of x with half of n and that multiplied with itself and so we can uh, evaluate the rules for calculating x to the power of n now if we would know or we would assume that n equals 5 we can rewrite our program we can partially evaluate it already and it becomes much simpler because then n is fixed to 5 so we we are left with f as a function of x which is simply x multiplied with x squared to the power of 2 and we're simplifying our program by partially evaluating it we don't know everything yet but we know parts of it and those parts we can uh, fill in uh, in what we know uh, what we have as a program which makes the program simpler now in a truffle program we need to implement um, uh, nodes uh, an abstract syntax tree consists of nodes and these nodes are actually just plain old java objects in the sense that they are a java class with some annotations possibly using some uh, some, some truffle provided APIs. In this case, we're seeing a AST node that increments the byte at the current slot in memory. And it does so by first looking up 
which uh, which slot are we actually looking at? I, I named that one the, the data pointer. Then uh, finding the slot for that based on that index. Then looking up the value that is there, increasing it with one and putting it back into memory. We saw two interesting things in a diagram just a few slides ago. One thing was called boundaries. Now, what are boundaries? This partial evaluation, as you may imagine, is quite a large task to do because even for a simple program, it will investigate the whole tree of uh, uh, of the, the the whole abstract syntax tree. But uh, that abstract syntax tree is rather large because our code can refer to standard Java code. It can refer to travel provided APIs and so on and so forth. And uh, a large part of that code is already highly optimized. We don't need to optimize it even further by inspecting if we maybe should optimize it to machine code. Uh, maybe we can do assumptions on whether this particular field is going to be a string or an integer. And using the bound truffle boundary annotation, we can say, well, this part of the code does not need to be um, analyzed by this partial evaluation process. And for instance, uh, if you want to print one character to a print writer, that piece of code is highly optimized in the Java virtual machine. It's not necessary to optimize that even further and doing so <clears throat> would actually largely increase the size of our final program while not adding any performance benefits. In the same sense, we saw that there is a concept called specializations. Now specializations allow us to provide specialized implementations given that we can do an assumption about the data that we have. This is where we say, hey, uh, maybe N is five. So for instance, we can say um, dividing two numbers by each other. Well, the quickest implementation is to just run A slash B, but this specialization is this implementation only works if B is not zero. If B was zero, this implementation would not work. Then there's no guard that try, catch, whatever. So the program would just explode, basically. Or let's see another example. Adding two integers together. Well, the quickest way to do so is not by running A plus B, but by running math dot of exact a, B. Why is that? Because this implementation uh, asks that A and B together still fit inside an int, while running A plus B may return a long, because A plus B may overflow the integer space. Now, this specialization has an uh, additional argument with it that says you need to rewrite this implementation if an arithmetic exception occurs, which means, hey, that value didn't quite fit in an integer. And in that case, the second implementation may be picked, but will be picked. But since that one is more expensive, we'd rather try this one first. So what happens if we run this function, if we would call this function with almost the maximum value and we would add one, then our first implementation will be selected. Why the first? Simply because that's the first one in our source file. This version will run without problems and we're good to go. If we run it again, this time with max value and one, well, we will still use the, that first implementation, but that will throw an arithmetic exception. And that means Grau, Truffle will select the second implementation to add with overflow, the one that is more expensive, but at least it works. And now if we would run the first invocation again, then Truffle cannot be sure anymore that um, the implementation that is there, up there will work. So it will again select the do out with overflow. So it basically invalidates an earlier assumption that it made about the, the, the result of adding A plus B. Now, this invalidation is interesting because in pseudocode, what happens there is that we call some uh, a special uh, truffle function called transfer to interpreter and invalidate. That's an interesting thing. It will tell truffle, hey, uh, 
uh, go back to interpreted mode. If you happen to be in native mode, go back to interpreted mode and invalidate any assumption that you made that uh, caused you to be here in the program execution. If you know about the semantics of that method, it would be enough to write just that. But unfortunately, a Java compiler is not happy with that. This function doesn't return a value and we must return a value. So we need to add the second implementation over there, which is less efficient, provides more bytecode, but yeah, we need it anyway. So that's why uh, running GraalVM, uh, why using uh, the GraalVM itself to run a Truffle program can be faster. This is one of the reasons for that. Now, we have touched quite some ground already when it comes to uh, how Truffle works and what you can do with it, what constructs it gives you. The next question is, how can we actually build a language using this wonderful technique? Let's take one step back and look at a very simple program. Here we have an, an, an expression, 734 minus 692. And the first step that we need to perform is lexing. And this happens to be the case for any program, by the way. That's why I said we're going to take a step back. There, this is this is really a very generic thing if you if you consider building a, any programming language. The first thing that we do is lexing, and lexing means that we take a sequence of characters, just a text file basically, and try to recognize tokens in it. Tokens are things that have a meaning inside our programming language. In this case, it will determine 734 and 692 to be numbers, while it will see the dash as a minus sign. It's not a dash, it's a minus sign. The second step is parsing, which takes this sequence of tokens and tries to build a hierarchical data structure from it. In this case, it would say, for instance, hey, that quite looks like an expression. The expression it happens to be a subtraction and the arguments for the subtraction are 734 and 692. Then again, if we would execute, it would of course be 42 because the answer to any big question is 42. Now, if you want to do this yourself, you basically have two approaches. You could write some regular expressions that try to match your, your inputs against these expressions and then well, process that. Uh, as we all know, um, if you have a problem, and you try to solve it with regular expressions, you typically have one more problem. So is there an alternative? Yes, there is. You could use a parser generator like Antler. A parser generator, and I'm not going to dive too much into that, is a tool that lets you generate a parser from some kind of a, a meta description. For this brainfuck example, I chose the first approach partially because I didn't quite understand Antler, let's be honest, also because the language is so simple that regular expressions could, uh, could uh, that I could get that to work without too much problems. So we have our parser, which actually is a lexer and a parser, so we can build an abstract syntax tree. We can annotate it using truffle annotations, but how can we actually run a program using the language that we developed? Well, to do that, we must be able to have something that we can distribute. GraalVM comes with a little tool called the GraalVM Updater, or GU for short, and you can use GU to install components into your GraalVM runtime. And components can be, for instance, tools or language packs. Well, a language pack, a language pack that sounds like exactly what we need. So we can use that to install additional things into our GraalVM runtime. Again, if you work with native executables, you may have needed to run GU install native image. In this case, we need to install a file that is not in the central repository. Uh, and that means that we add the dash capital L switch that says I want to install something, but it's a local file. It doesn't come from the central repository. With GU minus uh, or dash capital L install, the name of our component, we can transfer that component into our GraalVM runtime. So what is inside this jar file? If we would extract it, it would look like this. 
there's a folder meta.inf with permissions and symlinks, files that describe the permissions on these files, and symlinks provides a description of what symlinks to create. And uh, the manifest contains, of course, some meta information. And then the remainder of the archive is just a, a folder structure of files that need to be placed somewhere on the file system. So if we have installed that component, then we can use Truffle APIs to actually run programs in another guest language. The first thing we need to do, we need to prepare our source code. This one's hard coded, but it could also be read from an HTTP request, for instance. And we create a new source object. We need to specify its lang the language that the source is in, which in our case is BrainFuck or BF for short. Uh, we need to give it a descriptive name and we build that into an object. The next thing we do is we prepare a polyglot context from Gravian, which is done by saying I want a context that at least knows about the, the BF language. And I want to redirect my output to this byte array output stream. That step is not needed, but if you don't do it, then standard out will be standard out. So if I have my program that ends with a dot, it will just print to standard out, but I want to capture that output so I can display it in my web page. And that's why I provide this byte array output stream. And then I build the context. And finally, I can evaluate the source code in that context and afterwards capture the output that was written to my byte array output stream instead of to standard out. Here I'm printing it to standard out, but of course you could also embed that into a web page. Now we have our programming language. We can use it as a guest inside the Java virtual machine. So any Java program could benefit from it, but we're still not there when it comes to the things that GraalVM offers us for building our own languages. Because using GraalVM not only gives us high performance and, and great integration with the Java virtual machine, but it also allows our language to connect with tooling. What does that mean? Well, there's a couple of tools that already come with GraalVM. The most uh, promising one, I think, is the debugger. Let me show you how that works. We first need to run a program using the debugger. When we do that, hmm. must have changed over the last few weeks. Well, if you do that, you typically are greeted with something like this, this debugger listening on a specific port number, uh, and you can then get access to a URL that you can open in your web browser in Chrome uh, to, have, to use a Chrome debugger to browse for you, step through your code. As we can see in this screenshot, we can actually debug our BraveFuck code. We see the original code over there. We see our memory slots, and we can step through it using the standard tools that are available to you in the Chrome debug toolbar. Now, the interesting thing here, if you look carefully, you will see that the memory is only 30 bytes, not 30,000. I did that initially using 30,000 about 30,000 bytes, but it turns out that the Chrome debugger doesn't really like such a big local scope. It just comes to a freezing halt. Uh, so I decided that for debugging, sh showcasing how the debugger works, I needed to trim down the memory a little bit so that Chrome would actually appreciate running my program. Unfortunately, the live demo fails, so well, uh, we need to stick with the screenshot, but that's what it would look like. We could actually walk through our code. We could put breakpoints where we wish and continue execution until the next breakpoint, et cetera, et cetera. Another great tool that uh, comes with uh, GraalVM, which was added later, is the, the coverage analysis, which allows you to, uh, to analyze which part of your code base was or was not covered during program execution. At least you need to specify dash dash coverage. Optionally, you need to specify whether you want detailed output and where you want the output to be written to, for instance, to a file. And it will give you a short and concise report. In this case, it will just say, hey, all program uh, lines were covered. Or uh, 
I think this is a detailed report. No, this is not a detailed report either. Never mind. It can also provide you with a detailed report saying, hey, this particular line was covered, that particular line was not covered or just partially covered. And Truffle even allows you to write your own tools if you wanted to. And they call this the instrument API. The instrument API emits four types of events, and you can attach your tool to such an event to do things that you need to do. There's events for uh, source code being loaded, there's events for memory being allocated, events for uh, threads and language runtimes being created, and finally, events for application execution. This is what, for instance, the debugger uses because it says, hey, I'm going to execute this node of the AST. And the funny thing is that using this tool in your language isn't that much work. It's basically providing two things you need to indicate using annotations that your node is instrumentable. And for instance, for the debugger, you need, you need to tell the debugger, hey, if this node is being executed, this node originated from that particular location in the source code, file name, line number, column number. Because otherwise the debugger wouldn't be able, of course, to know whether you are, let's say, there or there in the program. But you don't need to know how a debugger works. And you don't need to write one, you need to provide the debugger with information. That's a very powerful concept because it's a lot less work. So it's time for a wrap up, ready? Going back to the initial question, can you run any language on GraalVM? The answer is yes. Yes, you can run any language on GraalVM, but it's not going to be an easy ride per se. It may take quite some time to have something running especially if, like me, you're not too well educated when it comes to implementing programming languages. I learned a lot over the course of that uh, journey. Uh, and, and making sure that your language is complete and uh, completely implemented and, and has everything that the original language has is quite a big job to do. But it can be a very fun ride. I think most companies would not be able to make any profit out of it, but I do know, I've, I've seen talks by a large American bank which had their own programming language, like decades old, and they had growing problems to find people who could maintain the implementation of that programming language, and they decided to research GraalVM and see if that would be a good platform to re-implement that language, because a lot of their business logic was written in that in-house developed language and they couldn't easily migrate away from that. So instead of rebuilding the business logic, they decided to rebuild parts of the platform where it runs on. If you want to get started, there's uh, two things for you to take away from this talk. The first thing is uh, you don't need to write your own parser. Yes, I know I did, uh, but it's, it's hard. Uh, even for such a small language, you can easily make mistakes. Um, and there's excellent tooling around, like Antler, that will allow you to build a parser from a meta description, which is way easier, and it provides, provides for a proven and performant implementation of your parser. And secondly, and that's really from my own experience, it pays off to take some time and think about what the abstract syntax tree should look like. In my first implementation, I made quite a few mistakes as to how the AST should look like, and some nodes were two nodes that should be one or just the other way around. And it turns out that it's um, very hard to trace bugs that originate from a wrongly designed AST because, well, your program runs on any other implementation of the language. It does not run on your implementation, and it gives some output that you cannot predict. And refactoring an AST later in the process is a lot harder and it's also very time consuming. Plus, as I said, it's very hard to, to actually understand why it goes wrong. I even added a few lines of code to be able to visualize these abstract syntax tree in order to understand what it actually looks like. So even for those small programs, the AST can become so large and overwhelming that it's it's necessary to visualize it using uh, some kind of a picture in order to understand what it does. 
Thanks for joining me today. I hope this was useful. If you are interested, you can check out the source code of my BrainFuck implementation. I've also started a follow-up project to find something more challenging, which is, well, really a work in progress. There's not that much to be seen yet, uh, but I decided to go for a more complex language and see if that could also work.